Thank you, Kristen. It's interesting how your words, how your little testimony there kind of points us to Andrew a little bit, who we're thinking about today, because just like you point all of us here to Jesus, so also did Andrew. So thank you for being amazingly appropriate for today. Today, as we're beginning this new series, there are these three words that came to mind as I think particularly about Andrew. The Apostle Paul wrote them in a chapter you're probably most familiar with, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. At the end, he writes, these three things abide, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. What Paul was talking about there is really the subject matter for another sermon, but he mentions hope. And I think right along with faith, hope, and love, hope really is an emotion that is so strong in us, right? I mean, can you imagine living without hope? I mean, if we're crushed, if we're limited, if we're, if we're, if we're in any way um, under pressure, under stress, feeling trapped in something, maybe through this whole COVID thing, maybe you felt trapped, maybe you felt crushed, and you felt maybe that hope was slipping away. And how sad that is when hope is gone. Because hope is what gives us this, this yearning, isn't it? When there's hope, there's this yearning for something better, for something different. There's this yearning inside of us that pulls us, that draws us to something different, draws us towards some change, some hope. I mentioned that because as I listen to what the scriptures say about Andrew, and they don't say a whole lot, but what they do say about Andrew gives us a clue that maybe Andrew was somebody very much like you and me, that he was yearning for something different, that he was yearning for change, that he was, that he was reaching for what he hoped would be a reason for hope. Andrew lives in a time, lived in a time very different from yours and mine. Um, Andrew lived 2,000 years ago, and we learn in our history books, you know, in your eighth grade history of the world class, you learn that the Pax Romana, you know, the Roman soldiers brought peace and prosperity to the Mediterranean world, and they did. I mean, the, the highwaymen, the robbers, and so forth were, were stopped in their tracks by those soldiers, but at a price. That meant there were occupying troops everywhere. There were foreign troops in, on Jewish soil. And so Andrew, living in Galilee, is very much aware of how crushing that is to have Roman soldiers stationed in his homeland. Because there's been a yearning in his culture. There's been a yearning. I think maybe the Jewish people taught us as a race to how to yearn because they've been yearning a long time, ever since the end of Second Kings, where, the ta where Jerusalem falls to the Babylonians and they're taken off into exile. They never have a king again. The promise that God gave to David, that there will always be a son of David sitting on the throne, that promise seemed very far away when the Babylonians pulled down the temple and burned David's old palace. So there was a yearning on the part of the people as they endured the occupation of the Babylonians, followed by the Medes, followed by the Persians, followed by Alexander and the Greeks, and then followed by his successors. And there was a moment, there was a moment about 100 years before Andrew was born, there was a moment when that hope seemed to bloom, to blossom, to flower, as the Jews threw off the Greeks and were independent for a brief time. But then came the Romans with their armies, with their soldiers, and occupied the land and called it theirs. So it seemed that hope was crushed. I mean, Andrew and his family seemed to have everything you'd want. We know Andrew had a job. He was in business with his brother, Simon. We know that there was a family because Simon Peter's got a mother-in-law, so there's a wife, and the way that People in Galilee built their houses. They usually built families, larger families kind of built their houses by each other, even connected to each other. So Andrew has shelter. Andrew has a place to belong. Andrew has family. He's got those basic needs taken care of. He's got a meal on his table. He's got people to, who, who know his name. 
He, he has people who would miss him. Maybe he's not there. But something is missing. There's some peace, P-I-E-C, missing in his life. How do I know that? Because John, the gospel writer, tells us where Andrew is. Andrew's hanging out with John the Baptist. Okay, John the Baptist is an itinerant preacher who's got a message that somehow speaks to the people because the crowds are coming out from even Jerusalem to be baptized. There's a yearning that John's message is hitting. And I think we all have some kind of yearning. That's what, what, what drives the philosophers, isn't it? I mean, back in Andrew's time, there's no shortage of philosophers. The, the Romans brought their gods, brought their philosophies, brought their, got, brought their cults. And in those Roman beliefs, there was some kind of answer to the yearning that's searching for that missing peace inside of us, that missing peace, P-E-A-C, that everyone craves. But the Romans had their philosophies. The Greeks had theirs too. We, some of them survived. There's the thing called Epicureanism. You may not have heard it with that name, but the eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we may die. That idea came out largely because there were these occupying armies. So if, we're not, if we can't have hope, at least let's have some physical pleasure. There were other philosophies too competing for people's minds, competing for people's hearts. But as the Romans brought their gods and the Greeks before them and the Persians and the Egyptians before them, it was pretty obvious that all those idols, like our own idols, are just extensions of ourselves, extensions of what human beings want, extensions of our brokenness because the Greek gods, the Roman gods, all did the same crazy things human beings do. And so there wasn't a whole lot of hope there either. But then here comes John the Baptist. And what kind of message is he preaching? He's preaching repentance. I mean, everyone else is preaching of find that God inside yourself, find your connection to God, to the, to the gods, and find how you can fit into the vast, stellar landscape. Find your peace in yourself, basically. And here comes John, preaching a message of repentance, calling them back to the God of the scriptures, calling them back to and away from satisfying oneself, calling them back to the Lord and calling them away from all those seekings inside of ourselves, of inside our hearts, inside our minds, trying to reach inside of ourselves to pull out that strength, to pull out that reason for hope, to pull out something that will fill that empty space. Here comes John. And Andrew, as he hears John preach this message of repentance, is drawn towards it because that God-sized hole, Augustine calls it, that God-sized hole in each of us finally hears an invitation, finally hears something different, finally hears something that might fill it. And so he's hanging out with John the Baptist, and Jesus walks by. And John the Baptist does something that was set a model for the way Andrew behaves later. He says, look, there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And that is amazing news because that is the message that all of Israel has been hoping for, especially Andrew, as he's looking for that missing piece. And so he follows Jesus. And don't you imagine that John wants you to hear the irony in what Jesus says to Andrew? Come and see. Come and see, not just see where I'm staying, but come and see with the eyes of faith. Because as Jesus meets Andrew, as Jesus spends time with Andrew, as Jesus teaches Andrew, suddenly there are needs that Andrew didn't even know that he had that are met in Jesus. And what does Andrew do? The moment he leaves Jesus, he goes and finds his brother, Simon. He says, we have found the Messiah. Andrew has moved from being somebody who was seeking, being somebody who was yearning, somebody who was focused on his needs, his empty spot, his brokenness, to now somebody having Jesus in his life, 
who goes and invites others. And it doesn't stop with Simon. Eric pointed out the young man with his loaves and fishes at the feeding of the 5,000. Andrew finds him, brings him to Jesus. In John chapter 12, there are these Greeks that are wanting to meet Jesus at the time that Jesus rides into Jerusalem on, the, on Palm Sunday. They find, they find Philip, and Philip goes, whoa, this is above my pay grade, and he finds Andrew, and Andrew takes these Greeks and introduces them to Jesus. There's no, there's no deep sermon or philosophical debate that Andrew has with them. He just says, look, the Lamb of God. The little boy, he doesn't, he doesn't ask, he doesn't do anything other than here's this kid with, fit with food. Behold, Andrew says, the Lamb of God. He finds his brother. Behold, the Lamb of God. So what does Andrew have to teach us? Well, I think there's quite a bit we have in common with Andrew. It's kind of interesting that Andrew, maybe ironic, that Andrew's name coming out of Greek means human, means the man. So he's kind of every man for us in a sense, except he's a real person. He's an invitation for us to see in Andrew ourselves because there's still that same yearning today, is there not? There's still that, that, that God-sized hole that everyone has. We miss, we miss as a race sitting with God in the cool of the evening in Eden. We miss that wholeness that we had with each other and with God now broken, now pulled away. There's that space that cries out for something to fill it. And so there's this yearning in everyone. And we still listen to the philosophers. We still go on quests to find ourselves. We still reach deep into ourselves to find us, try to find something we can pull out, some strength, some, some ideas, some, something in ourselves. We listen to the Greeks, we listen to the Romans, the Egyptians, all those other people still are telling us, pointing us to, to their gods. We come up with our own gods, thinking in each one of those we're going to find something, something that's going to meet this need, this yearning, give that, fill that space with that missing piece, P-I-E-C-E, as well as P-A-A-C-E. And then Jesus meets us as he met Andrew, then Jesus meets us. Whether it was in the waters of baptism, whose baptism we're celebrating for, with, for Kristen today as she makes confirmation of that faith. Today, as, you meet, as he meets you in the bread and wine of, of this meal, as he meets you in his word, Jesus meets you. Meets you. And as he did with Andrew, he also does for you changes you. He's changed you from being somebody who's been yearning for that answer, who's been yearning to find that something inside, who's been yearning for some sort of meaning in their life, even though your basic needs are met, your need for shelter, your need for friendship, your need for food. Those are all met. We're living in the first world here. We have those basic needs met like Andrew did. But there's still this longing, this longing. And Jesus meets us in our moments of need. And he gives us more than we thought we could ask for. We're looking for peace of mind, but he gives us peace through his death and resurrection. He gives us peace with God. We're looking for that missing piece of a felt relationship with God, and he gives us much more than in the cool of the evening with God in Eden. He gives us every moment of every day with him, following us, at, walking with us, carrying us through the difficult times, walking with us through the valley of shadows, gives us peace, P-E-A-C, with each other as his forgiveness takes root in our heart that we can forgive each other as he fills in that missing peace, P-I-E-C-E, -E, in our hearts and our souls. So what does, what does Andrew do? What can you and I do? I just realized I haven't been showing you the pictures, but I'll skip ahead because I like the that one that we 
you can be like Andrew. What does Andrew do? He introduces people to Jesus. What can you and I do? We can be like Andrew. We can introduce people to Jesus. We can say, like he did, behold the Lamb of God. I'm not sure what service he's watching. There's a guy in Colorado who watches our service. He's joined Bethlehem's family in that sense online. He tells me that he was in the hospital a couple of weeks ago. He had surgery. And he watches us online because he knows me, I guess. And so he made everybody on the floor watch Bethlehem's service with him. How simple. On his hospital bed, he points to the screen and says, look, the Lamb of God. Kristen, you did the same thing just a minute ago. Everyone's attention was glued to you as you said, hey, look, I want God in my life. I want Jesus in my life. Behold, the Lamb of God. You didn't make any fancy speech, although it was a cool speech. You didn't make any long sermon. There's no book of Andrew. There's no book of, of you, but there still is you pointing through that screen, pointing to everybody, look, there's the Lamb of God. Everyone in this room, you got friends, you got family members, you've got neighbors. Very simple. Be like Andrew. And as the conversation comes up, as the needs arise, as you see them struggling, yearning for that missing piece, that God-sized hole, to fill it with something meaningful, something useful, something good. When you hear them talk of that yearning, when you talk, hear them talk, and they share with you their story, you can say, hey, look, look at my, in my story, humble me. I'm a mess too, but look what God has done in my life with Jesus as he's given me his forgiveness, as he's restored me through his forgiveness so that I can sit with him in my moments and have him be with me and have him give me his peace as he fills the empty spot in my life with himself. And through your story, through your words, through your actions, just showing up for church today and encouraging the other folks, people sitting with you, you're saying, look, the Lamb of God, and having Jesus in my life changes me, so I do something different on Sunday mornings. I come to church. Jesus has changed my life, and I do something with my words. I speak forgiveness. With my gestures, I point out how Jesus has changed me. Behold, the Lamb of God. All the different, easy, simple ways to be like Andrew. And now may the peace that passes all understanding keep our hearts and minds in true faith in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.